Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I was a little slow to start there because I wasn't paying attention to my chat box. I want to welcome everyone to this program, <clears throat> The Mistrial of Eva Toguri and the Myth of Tokyo Rose, presented by the Ninth Circuit Judicial Historical Society and the Northern District Historical Society. Uh, the story of Eva Toguri and Tokyo Rose is fascinating, it's compelling, and it's just as relevant today as it was at the time that it happened. And we've assembled the most knowledgeable and interesting panel you could possibly imagine to tell you this story. I'll introduce my panelists in just a second, but first I have to get something out of the way. Let me tell you who I am. As I said a moment ago, my name is John Tiger, and I'm a judge here on the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. And the thing I have to get out of the way is to read some language for those of you who registered for MCLE credit. Please pay attention to these instructions in order to get your MCLE credit and your certificate of attendance. During the program, a numeric verification code will appear in the chat box. That's a feature of Zoom. If you haven't used it before, just look for the word chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You must record this code in order to receive CLE credit as this is a requirement for California CLE. After the event, you need to visit the Ninth Circuit Judicial Historical Society website, njchs.org. That URL is also in the program materials to complete the CLE verification form, which will call for this numeric verification code. After you've submitted the verification form, the NJCHS will process the form and send you your certificate of attendance. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. Let me introduce you to our fantastic panelists. First is Mike Weedall. Mike is the author of the book, Eva, The True Story of Tokyo Rose, a book of historical fiction that describes the events you'll be hearing more about this evening. My favorite fact about Mike is that in addition to being a successful published author, and prior to his doing that, he was vice president for energy efficiency at the Bonneville Power Administration. We'll also hear from Professor Chuck Wallenberg. Professor Wallenberg is the former chair of social sciences and professor of history at Berkeley City College, now retired. He's the author of a number of books and articles, focusing primarily on California history, but including the book, Rebel Lawyer, Wayne Collins and the Defense of Japanese American Rights, which focuses on the lawyer Wayne Collins and some of his famous cases, including the one we're talking about this evening. You'll hear from Professor Naoko Shibusawa, who is a tenured professor at Brown University, where she specializes in 20th century US cultural history. She also is the author of several books and numerous articles, including Femininity, Race, and Treachery, How Tokyo Rose Became a Traitor to the United States After the Second World War, a fascinating cultural look at the Tokyo Rose story. Finally, we'll be joined by Wayne Collins Jr., <clears throat> the son of rebel lawyer Wayne Collins, who took on some of his father's work when his father passed away in 1974 including the eventually successful effort to obtain President Gerald Ford's pardon of Eva Toguri in 1977. So as you can see, we really do have the best group of people manageable to talk about this fascinating topic. That's really it for me. My a job tonight, and I don't think it'll be easy because of how much there is to talk about, is to keep our panelists limited to prearranged time limits. So you'll hear from each of them for 10 minutes. Following that, we'll have a discussion among our panelists. I'm hoping that will be fairly free ranging and hopefully a little time for a Q&A session at the end. We promoted this program as going from five to 6 p.m. Uh, there are hundreds of people have registered and already we have 273 participants in the participant screen. So we probably will run over a little bit this evening and um, we hope that you'll stay for the whole program. With that, let me turn it over to our first panelist, Mike Weedall. Mike.
Mike, I think your microphone is on mute. How are we doing right now? Sounds great. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, sorry for that little glitch. And thanks for the opportunity to the sponsors to uh, have a chance to share a little bit about uh, Iva's story and the book that I've written. This certainly is an important story about a woman who faced challenges beyond her control and posed at a time of extreme politics and discrimination. There's an awful lot to talk about in Iva's life. And what I want to focus on is, uh, in the short time that I have, is the background that took her to Japan and the key factors that led up to her treason trial at the end of the war. So let's take a look and see how she ended up in Japan. So this is a picture of Iva taken in Japan during the war, the exact year I'm not sure of, but here's a woman in her mid-20s who looks much younger. It was a common reaction for what people met Iva to think she was still a teenager. But look closely. Here's a young woman born in the U.S. who grew up in Southern California and was totally Americanized. Her parents emigrated from Japan and so were precluded from becoming American citizens by law. As the first child born in this country, her father was proud of his all-American girl born on the 4th of July. She loved her life, her family, her country. And despite facing racial prejudice because of her Japanese ancestry, she never wanted to be anywhere else but in the United States. But even before the start of World War II, discrimination against Japanese Americans was quite open. Japanese immigrants, as I said, were legally blocked from becoming American citizens. Immigration was limited. And a common approach for Japanese wanting to come to America was to immigrate to Canada, become a citizen there, and use a Canadian passport to travel into the United States or back to Japan. Certainly one example of the discrimination I've experienced was being denied entrance to medical school after she graduated from UCLA. Her grades and test scores were higher than many of the men who were, who were accepted, but of course there was also the discrimination against women entering medical school at the time a true double whammy. Because Iva was a citizen in the United States, she was selected to travel to Japan by her family and visit her aunt's family, the Hattori's. Shizu, Iva's aunt, wrote that she was ill and wanted her sister to visit, but Iva's mother, Fumi, was even more disabled. Reluctantly, Iva agreed to a six-month visit. and She departed on her birthday, July 4th, 1941, and 22 days later, she arrived in Yokohama. There, she quickly learned that her aunt's illness was greatly overblown. Iva was immediately struck by the militaristic government and a country already on food rationing because of the existing war with China. She soon learned her letters home were being seized by the government censors because of how critical she was of Japan. Letters from home were similarly blocked. And by the time her father indicated she should leave Japan ahead of schedule, it was too late. Iva's worst fears were realized with the bombing of Pearl Harbor by Japan. Because of Iva's refusal to become a Japanese citizen, her family in Japan essentially forced her to move out on her own. Since the Japanese government used food to control their citizens, Iva was denied a ration card because of her outspoken loyalty to the US. She was then forced to take a series of low-level jobs to buy food, often on the black market at inflated prices. Eventually, she took a position in the typing pool at Radio Tokyo, whereupon she was forced to become an announcer on the radio program Zero Hour because of her American accent. Her only responsibility was to introduce records being played, but she, and she steadfastly refused to participate in propaganda broadcasts. During the war, and at great risk to herself, Iva would take from her meager resources to secure food and medicine that POWs uh, at being held at the bunker uh, POW camp in Tokyo um, needed. Um, the POWs working at Radio Tokyo would then sneak that into the um, uh, camp. This selfless act saved lives of several prisoners. When Iva first traveled to Japan in 1941, she weighed 114 pounds. And at the end of the war, she averaged 78 pounds. This is a picture of Tokyo near the end of the war. You can imagine the challenge for Iva and others to survive in a world where Allied bombing destroyed more and more of the city she worked in. Near the end of the war, just commuting to work to do shopping was extremely dangerous because of this nonstop bombing. I'm sorry I couldn't find the original photo of Iva broadcasting a Radio Tokyo, 
but this is uh, one that I incorporated a uh, banner, and I believe you might have seen in the role before we started this same picture. August 15th, 1945, four years and one month after I've arrived in Yokohama, the war with Japan was over. Keep in mind that the peace didn't bring any immediate change for Iva or others in Japan. There were still shortages of food, and Iva and her now husband, Philippe, were living day to day. She traveled to Japan without a U.S. passport, using instead what was called a certi certified letter of identification. Until she could secure a passport from the new American embassy, it was not clear how she'd be able to travel back to America, including getting enough money to pay for transportation. By this time, Iva was also aware that her, father, her family had been interred during the war in the U.S. and was in no position to offer any financial help. So enter Harry Brundage, a correspondent for Cosmopolitan magazine at the time and one of the first reporters to get into Japan with the initial wave of army occupation troops. As a reporter, Brundage knew the two most famous people in Japan that Americans wanted to hear about were the Emperor and Tokyo Rose. Since the Emperor was off limits and protected by the U.S. military, Brundage set out determined to find and get an interview with whoever was Tokyo Rose. But in fact, there was never anyone who broadcast for the Japanese using that title. Over 20 women broadcast between Radio Tokyo and Radio Manila during the war. The name Tokyo Rose was one invented by allied soldiers and sailors who loved to listen to Japanese programs like the Zero Hour because the Japanese often played better American music than allied broadcast and the Japanese would make outrageous claims of victories that the American soldiers and sailors found entertaining. One of the managers at Radio Tokyo told Brundage Iva was Tokyo Rose, so the reporter tracked her down and offered $2,000 for an interview. The offer of money, of money was a solution for the couple. She told Brundage up front that there was no Tokyo Rose, but the reporter responded that if she agreed to take that identity, she would be seen as a hero to, too many, to the many troops who were entertained during the war, and don't you really need $2,000? Iva agreed and signed a contract exclusively given the story to Brundage. Then she made a naive and inexperienced decision when she gave two interviews in subsequent days that violated the confidentiality clause, so she never received any compensation. What Iva didn't know was the reputation of Brundage as an unscrupulous reporter who cared little for the truth. Brundage's story that was carried nationally said Iva committed treason, and her, her, her troubles were immediately beginning. The next key character in Iva's story is Walter Rinchel, a true muckraking journal of the 19, a true muck, muckraking journalist of the 1940s. Like Brundage, Winchell's reputation was someone who level, never let facts get in the way of sensationalizing a story. His ruthlessness made him a feared man in political circles. Besides writing one of the most popular columns carried in Hearst newspapers nationally, his radio broadcast on Sunday evenings was must, must listening. He took the story written by Brundage claiming Iva was Tokyo Rose and made her a truly hated figure. As the 1948 presidential election, election started to heat up, Harry Truman was being accused of being soft on communism and treason. A convenient target to answer that charge now was Iva. Attorney General Tom Clark, who desperately wanted his boss, Harry Truman, to be reelected, soon joined Winchell in calling for Iva's prosecution. This is a mugshot taken of Iva during her first arrest in 1946. With the press stories back in the U.S., the 8th Army investigators and lawyers decided to incarcerate Iva and determine if there were reasons to bring charges. That investigation took over one year. During that time, Iva was held in isolation and only allowed one 20-minute visit per month from her husband. It was while she was in prison she started getting letters from her family, where she learned her mother died shortly after being interned in a horse barn in Tulare, California. This initial year-long investigation conducted by the Army and Justice Department in 1946 concluded Iva was innocent of any wrongdoing. She was released, whereupon she and Philippe renewed planning how they could emigrate to the U.S. However, the drumbeat by Winchell with support from the Attorney General soon led to a second arrest for treason and transportation back to the U.S. Soon you're going to hear more about the trial, but Wayne Collins, as you can see here, the quote he made, you know, following her conviction. I had said once that she knew she would have a difficult life. And her, you know, it wasn't until she got a presidential pardon that her last years were able to be spent peacefully. But in the end, the life she sought as a proud American was destroyed by her government. Despite being loyal during the most trying circumstances in Japan, sacrificing her own health to get food and medicine for POWs in Tokyo, 
being falsely identified as Tokyo Rose, losing her only baby in Japan and having the FBI destroy her marriage. She was always strong right through the end of her life. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Judge Tiger, but there's obviously a lot more for about her life. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, enjoy and encourage you to read the book. Judge? Thanks very much. So uh, there was a myth of Tokyo Rose, and that is uh, the voice of a, a Japanese woman who was feeding propaganda to American troops in English. And what we've just heard described is Iva Toguri, and I appreciate learning how to pronounce Iva's first name correctly. Iva Toguri was a convenient foil for that. And initially after having been determined to be totally innocent, was then charged with treason. And that's where we find her now. Let me turn things over to Professor Wallenberg, who will take us through the next chapter of this. Chuck? Is someone uh, blocking? Oh, there he goes. Okay. I, I still uh, am, am I, uh, can, just a second here. Hello, can anyone hear me? We can hear you quite clearly, but you're not appearing on the video quite yet. Well, um, so you can't hear me. Oh, I can hear you fine. I just can't okay. see you. We just can't see you. Let me see if I can start the video. Maybe that'll do it. Yes. Here we go. Terrific. Professor Good. Wallenberg. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about Wayne Collins and a little bit about the trial in the few minutes that I have. Um, when the government brought Iva to the United States in 1948 to uh, stand trial, her father, Jun, was looking around for a lawyer. And I guess it was inevitable that he would end up uh, contacting Wayne Collins. By 1948, Collins was recognized, at least certainly within the Japanese community, as the most uh, determined, committed, uncompromising um, defender of Japanese American civil and legal rights. He was the lawyer in the Korematsu case, which challenged the executive order that that uh, uh, allowed for the seizure and um, incarceration of people of Japanese descent living on the West Coast. He was the lawyer for the renunciant case, a case in, that involved 5,000 people imprisoned at the Tule Lake camp in um, Northeastern California who renounced their American citizenship in protest against their treatment and other cases as well. He was supported in these cases primarily by the Northern California branch of the American Civil Liberties Union, but he was opposed in these cases by the national leadership of both the American Civil Liberties Union and the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, Collins had a, had a real um, temper and he admitted that he never forgave and he never forgot. And for the rest of his life, he never forgave and he never forgot the national leadership of both the ACLU and the JCL. Um, the government had, a, or the prosecution had a very serious problem with the Iva Tuguri case because there were very, there was very little record of her broadcast. There were a few recordings and a few transcripts and none of those recordings and none of those transcripts uh, showed her doing much more than being a disc jockey who introduced American popular music and told really corny and lame jokes. Um, but the government insisted that in some of the other um, broadcasts, she did make comments that were favorable to the Japanese government and did make comments that were aimed at reducing the morale of American servicemen. In order to try to uh, prove that, the government um, presented a series of veterans who had served in the Pacific and they uh, testified that they had heard uh, Iva's broadcast. But as, as Mike has pointed out, there were several women who were making similar broadcasts. All of them were called by the American troops, Tokyo Rose. And it was never really determined that the broadcast that these 
um, witnesses were describing were ones that had actually been made by Iva. Um, the government also brought the colonel who was in charge, the Japanese uh, army colonel who was in charge of the English language broadcasts at Radio Tokyo. And he did testify that the purpose of the broadcast was to reduce the morale of American troops. But he couldn't say what Iva had said in the broadcast because he didn't speak English. So in many respects, probably the two most important witnesses for the government were two Japanese Americans, men uh, born and raised in the United States, who took up Japanese citizenship and who served in Radio Tokyo in the English language broadcast program. And they both testified virtually identically that they had heard Iva make statements similar to those that the government had charged, including comments about the sinking of allied ships. Um, and the, the fact that two people said this was very important because under the treason um, law, the prosecution needs two witnesses for every specific act of treason. Um, in in um, Collins pointed out that it was really amazing that these two guys could remember the exact words that Iva had said in a broadcast four years before. So we asked them whether they could remember what they had for breakfast that morning or what the weather was like in Tokyo that day. Um, the fact that they were quote unquote turncoats was something also that he made a big uh, deal of. One of the men had been a Cal graduate and then served in the ROTC at, at the University of California. Um, Collins asked him to recite the Pledge of Allegiance uh, of the, to the American flag. Um, and of course, as it's turned out, Collins's um, doubts about the integrity of, the, of, this, of these witnesses was more than borne out, but more than 25 years later, when um, the reporter for the Chicago Tribune in, in uh, Tokyo got them to confess that they had both lied on the stand during the trial and that they had been in effect encouraged if not required to lie by agents of the American government. Um, Collins also had a very difficult time, Collins and his defense team, dealing with Judge Michael Roach, who was the district, federal district judge who tried the case. He later said, he later admitted um, uh, to a reporter that he was sure that she was up to, to no good, that, that she was guilty of something perhaps. He very greatly limited the scope of the uh, defense and what they could bring up. And perhaps most uh, harmful of all was his instruction to the jury. He instructed the jury that they could not take into consideration the fact that she had been um, in effect um, giving food and medicine to POWs at great risk to herself. He said he couldn't, they couldn't uh, consider the fact that she was ordered to make these um, broadcasts by the Japanese military. Um, the, the, um, one of the jurors said that in effect, after the judge's um, instructions, many of the jurors simply couldn't couldn't feel they could do anything else but find her guilty. Um, and in, and uh, eventually the jury voted nine to three in favor of, of uh, conviction. But the three holdouts refused to, uh, to give in. And so eventually the jury reported that um, they were unable to get a unanimous verdict. Instead of declaring a mistrial, Judge Roach gave them a, basically a lecture saying that um, the government had spent 13 weeks on this trial. It was the longest uh, criminal trial in the Northern, in um, the Ninth Circuit at that time. And the government had spent $700,000 on the case, again, more than they'd spent on any other case up until that time. And he in effect said the jury was obligated to come up with a verdict. And so eventually the three holdouts um, uh, gave in and agreed to find her guilty of one um, count of treason. The, um, the verdict was, was a surprise to a lot of the um, people who had sat through the trial. There were 10 reporters assigned full-time to this trial, which gives you some idea of what a big deal it was. 
and they held a, an informal poll among themselves and it was nine to one in favor of acquittal. The um, alternate juror who sat through the whole trial but didn't, didn't take part in the jury's deliberations was shocked at the fact that her fellow jurors had um, found her guilty. But if there was shock and surprise at the verdict, there was real shock and real surprise at the, um, at the, uh, uh, the judges, um, no, I'm trying to say his, his, um, <laughs> at, oh, the, at the penalty that the, that, 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 that the judge um, came up with. He, he, um, she was given 10 years in federal prison and she was fined fine $10,000, which today would be something like $100,000 in today's money. And of course she lost her citizenship because of the treason uh, conviction. She was a model prisoner and she only had to serve six years, but literally as she came out, as she came to the gates of the prison, immigration agents informed her that she would be deported to Japan. And Collins spent a year appealing the deportation decision. During that time, Iva lived with the uh, Collinses in their San Francisco home. I know Wayne told me, Wayne Merrill told me that the only reason he passed his math class that year was because of her help on his, on his homework. But eventually the government agreed not to, um, not to deport her. And she was able to join her family in Chicago, where she managed the, the family's uh, gift store for literally for decades. Um, Wayne Collins called this case America's Dreyfus case. And for the rest of his life, he tried to get the verdict overturned, but he was unsuccessful. However, in 1974, when he died at the age of 74, a new yeah. campaign. Professor Wallenberg? I don't want to jump in here because I think Wayne Collins probably wants to talk about those events. Right, so that's what I'm going to, just, just what I was going to say. I was going to say that uh, that the a new campaign that was eventually to lead to her um, to to a presidential pardon was started up in 1974 and 1975, and Wayne was intimately involved in that, and he's the person to talk about that story. And I guess I've had my ten minutes of fame here, so. Uh, uh, so before I turn it over to Professor Shibasawa, just a couple things. For those of you who don't know how to use the chat, uh, I mentioned that you need a code for your MCLE. I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's 57900. 57900 is the code you need for your MCLE. Second, we welcome your questions. Uh, please send them on the chat either to Scarlett Espinoza or Neha Gupta. They appear right there in the chat box. If you don't know how to do that, if you just send the questions to everybody, it's not the end of the world. We can figure it out. But Scarlett Espinoza or Neha Gupta would be great. And then also I want to say Professor Wallenberg's book, which I read to get ready for this panel. I didn't know this. This trial was the most expensive trial ever conducted in a United States federal court. Up until, up until that time, at least. Then. Up until that time. Yeah. And so shocking to me, shocking that this story is not more widely known. Also that jury instruction the judge gave to get a verdict finally would be unconstitutional today. We would not allow that. In state court practice, we call that an Allen charge. A lot of judges would call that a depth charge. It's just something you don't do with juries in your typical case. So anyway, fascinating. Professor Shibasawa, uh, let me turn it over to you. All right, I'm up. Good evening. Um, first of all, I want to thank Judge Tiger for moderating and to Scarlett Espinoza and to Niha Guha for organizing this panel. I am totally flattered and honored to be included. So for Mike Weedle and Professor Wollenberg, we have gotten the context, the basic story about what happened to Togarty. So the question remains, why does this happen to her? Why the U.S. government spend $700,000 in this big effort to prosecute her after being advised not to do so? Was it perhaps to justify the wartime policy of Japanese American family detention after the fact? I don't think so. And if you wanna know why, please ask me during the Q&A. I would argue instead that it was the Cold War context and that heightened concerns about loyalty. And that made the federal government double down, so to speak, on cases of disloyalty. But still, why Togori? Especially since that case had to be manufactured. And the simple boiled down answer is this racism cells. But how and why racism cells is much more complex. Racism is never just about hating somebody of a different skin color. 
Racism is, is what we call structural racism, a system that is enabled by laws and policies. The Nisei of Togedi's generation were what historian May Nye calls alien citizens. That is to say, Togedi was a birthright U.S. citizen, but also considered a racially unassailable alien. Her immigrant parents had been denied the ability to become naturalized due to the Naturalization Act of 1790, which was upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1922 Ozawa ruling. During World War II, the federal government called Nisei, the Japanese Americans, non-aliens, you know, AKA citizens, right? Calling them non-aliens was a linguistic ploy to obfuscate the fact that the Niseis were having their citizenship rights stripped away without due process. It's important to remember that structural racism is intersectional, meaning that it operates with other hierarchies of power determined by gender, sexuality, class, nationality, empire, etc. They rationalize and explain why certain people are to be are seen as to be trusted, as reliable, as level-headed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and why other people are not. And what was crucial in Togedi's case were how notions about gender and patriotism worked in conjunction with race. So even before the end of World War II, Tokyo Rose was a household name. She was an imagined seductress, a vengeful madam butterfly, a combination of Asian femininity and so-called oriental treachery. And it is telling that Americans did not imagine a parallel fictional character for the Japanese male broadcasters or for male broadcasters, period, as in the case of the two Axis Sallies. And how that, that case will show that. If you want to know more about that, I can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, Togori's actual name, Orphan Anne, was a riff that was a combination of the abbreviation, abbreviation for announcer, Anne, and Orphan, to evoke that all-American spunky heroine, Orphan Annie. Like the GI so far away from home, Togori also felt orphaned in the Pacific. She was convinced by the POWs who were running the propaganda show, who were forced to run the propaganda show, that she would help them subvert the propaganda goals by being a cheery disc jockey that played American tunes across the Pacific. But the idea that a young, non-white female patriot could be an active agent behind enemy lines due to her devotion to the nation and not to some lover was totally unbelievable to journalists Clark Lee and Harry Bundridge. All they cared about was their exclusive scoop, and so they had her sign a piece of paper saying that she was the one and only Tokyo Rose who had no feminine assistants or substitutes. They more easily saw her as a traitor, even though she didn't look as it like their imagined seductress. They refused to believe that this non-white woman in pigtails could be a GI sweetheart who boosted the morale of servicemen in the Pacific. But Togudi's idea of herself wasn't a complete delusion. In fact, for about a month after the story broke in early September 1945, U.S. servicemen in Japan seemed to be her fans. She was picked up for questioning after Lee's article appeared in Hearst newspapers um, by military intelligence, but that meeting was interrupted by friendly soldiers eager to see her. Even Lieutenant General Eichelberger, the commander of the 8th Army, stopped by to thank her for cheering up GIs during the war and also asked for her autograph and also asked to have a photo taken with her. A couple days later, the sound crew of the USS Mitchell produced a short film in which ended with a voice saying, well, thank you very, very much, Tokyo Rose. We in the Navy want to know that we appreciate your broadcast and your music. But one month later, in October 1945, Togori was picked up by military intelligence again, but this time she was put into Sugama prison without being charged with a crime. The intelligence chief admitted to journalist Mark Gain that they had no solid evidence against her. Um, but he said, we don't dare release her yet because we know you boys, you journalists, will promptly jump on our necks. So Togori stayed in prison for a full year. And after she was released, an article buried in the 14th page of the New York Times explained that the government had decided to drop the case because Tokyo rose with a composite person with at least a dozen voices. Six months later, Togori attempted to go back home and to be reunited with her family. And that's what triggered the US press to demand prosecution and the Justice Department did a, like a 180. So the question is why? Well, one reason is because they could. Witnesses were manufactured, as you just heard, and, and the other thing is that Togori kept her citizenship, unlike 
all the other Nisei broadcasters who chose to relinquish their U.S. citizenship. And this is why the original acts of Sally, you know, that case was dropped because that woman had gained, you know, dropped her U.S. citizenship and became an Italian citizen, and why Margaret Gallars, who later became known as Axis Sally, was charged and actually went to jail because she had kept her U.S. citizenship. Second, through a combination of racism, sexism, and nationalism, prosecuting a myth, right, prosecuting that myth, personified into an actual hapless human being, served careers, sold newspapers, held advertisers of the print and airwaves. And the combination continues to be an, early, an easy sell to an American public primed to believe in these hegemonic narratives today. But this is a takeaway I want y'all to have, which is this. The counter hegemonic narrative could have prevailed. What would have happened if a journalist went in with the initial GI reaction? And what would the treatment of Toguri have been? You know, if she was seen as the GI sweetheart that she knew herself to be rather than Tokyo Rose. Thank you. What a great question. Um, I just want to encourage everyone again to send in uh, questions. Uh, we're starting to see some in the chat box. Uh, that brings us to Wayne Collins Jr. Uh, Jr. because he's the son of the Wayne Collins that we've been hearing so much about over the last several minutes. So um, Wayne, let me turn it over to you. Wayne, I think you're still on mute. Good. That was a good thing. Well, we've had some interesting discussions and some really ingenious presentations. Uh, of course, everybody can have disagreements. But I think that the Toguri case is a very complex one historically. And you have to look at it in terms of history at that time. The United States has always indulged in repression of minorities and of criminal defendants. He may have been born as a birth of freedom with rights of criminals, rights of the citizens to be protected in the Constitution. But regardless of those guarantees, they seldom are. In World War I, they put 2,000 people in jail for opposing the war. Some people got 20 year sentences, 10 year sentences. Some were in jail for almost a decade. And the repression was incredible and makes the McCarthy period look like child's play. Then came World War II and the same phenomena. This time it was racialized. That racialization has to be it's the background of a long history of anti-Asian sentiment in California, which would boil up periodically, whether it be into riots or acts of discrimination and of which the insistence upon evacuation was one more example. And Frank Murphy called it right uh, in the dissent in the Korematsu case when he pointed out to that, that social phenomenon history and particularly in California. But I think Iva's case is somewhat unique. In her case, we see repeated examples of misconduct not just the judiciary, but the prosecuting attorneys. And if American justice is supposed to mean that justice is sought by the agents of the state, that perhaps US attorneys should consider determining whether a party is guilty or not is the important thing, or whether their career and a conviction is the important thing. And nothing like Tom DeWolf's conduct in the so-called Tokyo Rose trial, evidence is that, that uh, terrible weakness of lawyers and of the system and of the judiciary and how it enforces the so-called neutral rights of parties before the law. Not only do Wolf's participation in what to me seem unlawful interference with defense witnesses, let me give you an example. Norman Reyes was on the stand for four days Norman Reyes was summoned by a subpoena for the defense. Norman Reyes met with Tom DeWolf, uh, Agents Dunn, and Agents Tillman of the FBI. Three days in a row, four days, before he took the stand unbeknownst to the defense. 
and proffered three statements at variance with the testimony he gave on direct. Those government agents were present for a total of 20 hours over four days, grilling him from nine to six. DeWolf was a participant. Now that's criminal in my opinion, for any lawyer to indulge in that. Let me leave that to one side. The government impeded the witnesses who were actually coming to this country from Australia. Kenneth Parkins and uh, Charles Cousins. Cousins who wrote the transcripts that she often read. Parkins who also wrote transcripts. These are all from Bunker prison camp and boarded the plane which landed at San Francisco airport took those two witnesses off the plane into a warehouse adjacent to the end of the strip, took out their guns, put them on the table, and began to grill these defense witnesses. My father was waiting for them at the airport. They didn't show up. He found the crew. They got the captain. Oh, they're in the, at the shack in back of the warehouse at the end of the runway. He knocked on the door. No answer. He broke it down. That's what had happened. That ended the tete-a-tete -tete between the government and defense witnesses. That's the kind of conduct that they engaged in. That actually came out in the trial. They didn't know the defense about the conduct with Norman Reyes until later when they had to uh, resuscitate his evidence on redirect. That went on constantly. Take the conduct of Brundage, the journalist, He'd gotten Iva to sign notes he'd made purportedly of a conversation that implicated her. Now we can talk about Iva's weaknesses and immaturity, the, the need, the fact that they were virtually starving, the couple at that time, and she signed a document that she shouldn't have. She wanted $2,000. It was ill-advised. That's just ordinary human weakness and we can put that to one side and ignore it for now. But the fact is that when Brundage returned to the US and she'd been found not fit for trial because she was innocent by a year long investigation, Brundage told the US attorney he had a confession. He didn't. They saw the notes. They said, that's no good. That's no confession. That one wasn't signed. They said they got him signed. British goes back to Japan with a United States agent and a prosecutorial agent. And they are armed when they interview her and she signs the notes. Now, it may not be subordination, it's something worse. It is an attempt to totally disrupt the functioning of a democratically elected government and court. And that's what they were doing. And they didn't care. Tillman, I keep mistaking him for Pitchfork Ben Tillman. Tillman, FBI agent uh, who participated in the grilling of Norman Reyes, was also present in Japan. How did he get to go to Japan? Why? Well, a defendant has the right to cross-examine witnesses against her and also to call witnesses in their own defense. But it's hard to call witnesses in your own defense when they're in a foreign country which has occupied the United States Army. And the United States government will bring anybody it wants from Japan to testify. Let's go. They pick them up and they bring them. And they pay them a per diem rate. And they also have a lot of dirt on almost every witness they brought because they were all married to women who were Tokyo Roses. Whether it be, you know, Mary Ishii or Catherine Reyes or others, that was the case for virtually all of them. Even when they weren't an American national, they had to be, they were the wives of people who renounced their American nationality. So their wives had to suffer. Nobody went into that courtroom as a witness for the prosecution that wasn't under terrible pressure to perjure themselves. Now, I'm not saying they weren't quite willing to do that anyway. You know, a lot of them were young. When they say that, dumb, you're dumb when you're young. You're susceptible to all kinds of pressures when your country's occupied, when you're starving, when you don't know what your future holds or brings. These guys were, as I say, young. Some of them renounced their American nationality. Why was that? 
They thought Japan was going to win the war. When did they renounce? 1942, after the first six months. That's the way it looked. You're stuck in Japan. What are you going to do? You're going to be an idiot and not renounce it and be an American citizen sitting around in Japan, which is going to win the war, which you were which you're told every day, like Americans were told during Vietnam, had won enormous victories. I think it was Kenkichi Oki who said, well, he'd, he calculated by his own uh, statistics from Dome, he knew what the American losses were. The Japanese press claimed to have sunk the American Navy 10 times over, halfway through 1942. That's the level of exaggeration that was going on in the press in Japan. Japan was not a democratic country. Its last democratic government was ousted from power in 1934, 1936. They're looking at a country where 15,000 people were put in jail because so they wouldn't embarrass the emperor when he was coronated. But that's the kind of country it was. It's a fascist power. The pressure on civilians to toe the line has to be enormous. So I think you should look at the entire trial and the entire behavior of all the people involved in that context. The most reprehensible behavior was that of the US government and its agents. Now, it's not alone uh, that they interfered with the defense witnesses arriving in this country. Because Iva had no subpoena power within Japan, nor did an American court have subpoena power within Japan. And the defendant had no money. The defense made a motion requiring the government to put up funds to allow the defense to get to Japan and to take depositions of potential witnesses. To get that, they had to file a list of all the witnesses they wanted to depose in Japan, Wayne? The testimony they wanted to proffer. Wayne, Wayne. We're, we're coming up on time and I'm hoping that you'll turn to the question of this pardon from President Gerald Ford because I promised our audience you would tell them about it. So get it, give me one minute. The FBI agents interviewed all the defense witnesses one month in advance of their deposition being taken in Japan and thwarted their defense testimony and impeded the integrity of those witnesses offering many not to cooperate in the defense thereafter. That's the last piece of information for you, the pardon. In 1976, the United States citizens, I think were prepared to recognize that their government had indulged in dishonesty with the public, could do wrong, could suborn perjury, could lie about the events taking place in the foreign war to the people and to the army. This was after Watergate. And it was time to say, well, maybe the American public is more susceptible or willing to listen to this kind of story. In 1951, one article was printed with regard to Iva's case after she was incarcerated. That was in a magazine called City Lights Journal. Almost no circulation, article by George o. Olshausen on sexism, gender, racism, history, Matahari, et cetera. No circulation to the article. And another one in a mimeographed magazine, and that was it until the 70s. The po whole problem for Ivo was she was greatly at odds with the JACL. The JACL had found her guilty, refused to speak for her, denounced her, and said that she was guilty. Sato you mind, said that. Find our audience what the JACL was, please. Japanese American Citizens League. Thanks. An organization which quite frankly, was appointed as the spokesman for Japanese America by the media and the US government. That's a whole other story, but that's neither here nor there. They had done nothing to assist either in obtaining a pardon. Two applications for pardon have been denied, but times had changed. In 1975, I saw in the Hokobe Mainichi, a local daily paper, that um, David Yoshida had delivered a speech to the Sierra chaplain, that's Palo Alto, I believe, of the JCL, and he called for a pardon for Ivan Toguri. Now, none of us were willing to speak to the JCL for years, including Iva, and I couldn't do that, so I 
sent a letter to David Yoshida, who's an accident reconstructionist and a physicist expert witness, saying, uh, take a look at this accident report. Tell me if I can defend this driver. Call me up. Wayne, you know damn well that this driver is indefensible. Now, why did you send me the case? Well, so I read your speech. What can we do about it? I'm quite prepared to talk to the JCL. Talk to Ivor about it. I said, look, you know, the JCL is a different generation now than it was before. And you can't charge the sons with the crimes of their fathers. It's a different organization, populated by different people who are prepared to think differently. It's time to bury the hatchet and see if they will assist in a pardon campaign. And so it came about that they could work together. And she acquiesced in their campaigning for a pardon for her. We'd already uh, begun to prepare for a application for a pardon at that time. I talked to Olshausen about it, who was in the United States for a brief six months in 1974 to see me about a lawsuit I was filing for him. The JCL formed the Toguri Committee, independent of the body of the JCL, such and not subject to its own control. Clifford Ueda, a retired pediatric physician, chaired that committee. Hey, Wayne. Yeah. Wayne, I hate to do this, but I'm wondering if there's more of a trailer version of this that we could get to. Because I'd sure. love to ask this I love to ask the panel to talk amongst themselves and get some audience questions. Speak. No, no, no. I just no. like you, I just like to know when did she get the pardon? I'm not, 19, trying, to, I'm not, trying, to, end, I'm not 19, trying to bring the story to no conclusion. I'm just trying to bring it to a conclusion. 1976, when Gerald Ford, Gerald Ford was a lame duck incumbent president. And when we were able to ally ourselves with the JCL, which had access to media and avenues of communication and political support. And that was the key to obtaining it. Do you, think, do you think the fact that he was lame duck made it easier to get? That was deliberate. We filed the petition so that it would arrive in, in Washington before the election, but with a fairly certain degree of, of, of conviction that he would not act on it in time for the election. But if he did, well, and he was reelected, he'd had four years to, to write it out. And he was a lame duck. He had nothing to lose by granting it. Right. Lawrence Schriller, a pardon attorney, you know, spoke to me on the phone. He agreed completely with that procedure. So there you have it. Let me ask the panel, we've gotten some great questions in the chat. And this whole story is, is uh, has so many great twists and turns and so many terrible things happen along the way, really. Um, what are the lessons for the judiciary and today's <coughs> lawyers? And I don't think you need to be a lawyer to answer that question. What are the lessons for today's lawyers and, and judges? Chuck Wallenberg, let me start with you. What do you think the answer to that question is? Well, you should never, I mean, all the things that Wayne has just described and some of the things that the press, I mean, this, this, is the, this is how to not to provide justice for citizens of the United States. I mean, it's, there was nothing, nothing in this whole set of procedures that, that had anything to do with justice. It had all to do with politics, it had all to do with racism, it had all to do with various aspects of sexism. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, just, just uh, to kind of do the thing with the, with the pardon, it literally got down to Gerald Ford's last day in office. And one of the last actions he took before he turned the, uh, before he turned, turned it over to, to his successor, Jimmy Carter, was to issue this pardon. But it really got down to whether he was going to issue the pardon before he left the White House. Nail biter. Nail biter. But, but I mean, I think I, 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 this is a how to, this is how to, run a judicial system and a justice system in a way that guarantees no justice and uh, no reasonable and rational outcome. It's a very good tagline, how not to provide justice to the citizens of the United States. Um, Professor Shibasawa, if you were uh, explaining to your, one of your classes on the intersection between gender and race, 
and culture, explaining to them the significance of these events today, what would you say? That's a good question. I would say it's ongoing, right? That I like to, like, we can think that the sort of the abuses in power were something that were exceptional that happened to this one woman, but I wouldn't think they are. I'm not so sure that we can rest and say, oh, this is something that just happened in the 1940s and 1950s. That's what I would say. You'd about say it's that. powerful, but not exceptional. Yeah, I would say it's powerful, but it's not exceptional. It's, it's actually par for the course, which is the sort of the thing that I was seeing at the end, right? That these, these intersectional oppressions still operate. And the fact that the, you know, the racism and the sexism and all that still work, it's really sells. Racism sells, it really works. The American public still is prime for this sort of stuff. It could be the sort of vulgar stuff that we've seen about build the wall, et cetera, et cetera, but it could also be much more subtle as well too. And then I am not obviously a lawyer at all. I was supposed to be a lawyer according to my parents, but um, it seems to me also what I saw in this is that there's also a, a drive for the win. The drive for the win seems to cloud the issue of justice overall, right? So it seems like that- right, that they, This is what Wayne was saying earlier, right? Yeah. So win at all costs. Right, yeah. And so that seems to like, that's, that seems to be like the bigger sort of like you, you lose, you, you take your eyes off the prize, which is supposedly justice. That's what it occurs to me. Uh, I've gotten a question in the chat box. How can we contact the panelists for follow-up questions? And I should tell all of my panelists, you're getting a lot of praise and compliments in the chat box as we go along. Some of our, of our attendees like your presentation so much, they wanna keep going with you even after our panel has concluded. So um, I think my suggestion will be, you can let, uh, if, if those of you who've asked that question, uh, our panelists can tell Neha Gupta or Scarlett Espinoza if they wanna give that information out. And, and, and have those further um, conversations. Wayne, let me ask you a question. You talked about some of the attorney misconduct in the case. Uh, was there ever any uh, discipline of any kind for those prosecutors? None that I know of. Although DeWolf did kill himself a few years later. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's very a lot interesting. of things happen when you jump out a window in Seattle. I was asked in the chat, I actually knew, I know one of these answers myself, but only because I read some of the panelists published work. And that is what was the composition of the jury? It was six men and six women, they're all white. And the prosecutor struck all the Asian and black jurors from the veneer before they seated the jury. Yeah. Um, Mike, let me ask you a question. I think during, when we were preparing for the panel, you indicated you've spoken about your book publicly before, you've told this story before, uh, you've got a, a longer version. When you're giving this presentation publicly, how do people who've never heard about Iva Taguri before, how do they react? Well, um, uh, you know, I just want to follow up and clarify on that last point about jury selection. Not only did the prosecution strike all the minorities, when the prospective jurors were brought into the courthouse, all the minorities were put in a separate room from the whites. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, so what is a stacked deck? But your, 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 your question, uh, Judge Tiger, um, I think people are just surprised uh, because, you know, as you frame things up front, uh, you know, the common perception of Tokyo Rose is, yeah, here's someone who was a traitor, traitor to, and, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, the, there's all kinds of things that are out there that were written about her, including I remember growing up watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon. So the negative myth of Tokyo Rose continues to this day is what you're saying. Yeah, because sort people, of yeah. Siren, the siren song of the Japanese Mata Hari, all that stuff. Right. And, and I all think, she ever did was play records and tell jokes and make American servicemen feel a little better about where they were. Yeah, in a very t difficult situation where she was struggling to get food and, you know, just wanted to get back. Uh, you know, I think it was pointed out uh, that, you know, the other women, you know, t had taken Japanese uh, um, citizenship, but Iva refused to give up her American citizenship and was punished all the four years and one month during the war by the government. So she was punished for her patriotism. Punished for her patriotism, visited uh, regularly by the secret police. Chuck, was there an appeal in this case? Did, did yes, he, uh, 
Collins appealed to the Ninth Circuit and also went, tried to go directly to the Supreme Court, but he was turned down. I mean, he, he tried to appeal, but the, basically the case was, was turned down. He also, I, th I think as Wayne mentioned, there were two different attempts to get a, to get a presidential commutation or a presidential pardon before finally the, the, um, the pardon was issued by, by Gerald Ford. Wayne, when, when the president issued his pardon at that time, or at any time subsequently, has there ever been an apology on the part of the United States government or any of its representatives to Iva Toguri or her family? Not by the government, uh, but by the Japanese American community, by many politicians. Remember, America had changed. By the time that we were able to obtain the pardon, we had a Japanese American senator and a Japanese American governor of Honolulu, of Hawaii. Uh, Ariyoshi. And Ariyoshi, even before the uh, Yates article came out, had, had called for a partner for her. So the Chronicle, I mean, the Chronicle uh, of all papers had supported a pardon. The Los Angeles City Council had supported a pardon. You had Harakawa in the U.S. Senate. Things had changed a bit. Uh, you couldn't have done that before the 70s. Uh, but no one took an official uh, uh, position that the government should formally apologize to her. You know, one thing, and, and I think Wayne probably will, I think would, you know, so far we've been talking about Iva as just, just a kind of a helpless victim, but she was a very competent and take charge person on her own. I mean, just the fact that she, that she survived all this is, is an amazing thing. And I think, you know, once the campaign for the final pardon occurred, she played a major part in that. And a major thing was she appeared on 60 Minutes. Um, and she took charge of, of that segment of 60 Minutes and made her case in a powerful way. And that was a time when I think 60 Minutes was one of the, was maybe the highest rated uh, network TV show. So, Let me ask everybody so she, she, she really is a, an, an agent in her, in her own defense. Let me ask everybody a couple of questions that are popping up on the chat, and I, I'm not even sure who to direct these to. Uh, the first question is, um, how does anybody know how Iva Toguri is regarded in Japan? How is this story told, if it is told, in Japan? Does anyone know? There, um, there was, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say that I'm, I'm not sure how she's regarded, but I think an interesting footnote is, Iva's father, Jun, who was very active in the Japanese American community here in the 1970s was brought back to Japan by the emperor and recognized for his work in helping Japanese uh, immigrants. And uh, when uh, Iva, you know, uh, when he asked Iva if she wanted to go with him to Japan, she was like, Hell no. Yeah. <laughs> so, My last trip didn't work out that way. Because her father was an amazing guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, then, there, was, there, there, there is one book written on the case by a Japanese scholar whose name I can't remember now, and it, it's sympathetic to her, to her point of view. I would guess it's sympathetic as well, too. I yeah. haven't researched that part. Did she ever speak publicly about her experience? What's well, interesting she, is there's so much material but I, I'm not. I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing in her life story that she was out, you know, publicly talking about. It. Did she do that? Well, as I say, this this 60 minute segment is maybe the most, the, the one that had the most, the biggest audience and, and the most yeah. effect on public opinion. But she yeah. wasn't. She wasn't going to universities and giving speeches and that sort of thing. No, no. From what I understand is that she was waiting to do a book on her own and to do something on her own, right? And then, so she was pretty stingy about giving interviews. So I was actually in the Chicago area, but couldn't get an interview with her. Um, I was there because uh, I got my degree at Northwestern. And it was really hard to do that. And then, so the irony is that a bunch of us have kind of furthered our own careers in a way, right? Like I wrote an article, I wrote about it in my dissertation, but she herself never really got to capitalize on on the myth of Tokyo Rose in a sense, right? I mean, there were a lot, there's lots of books. There's all this stuff about her. Right, but she herself has was never able to capitalize it in a sense. Yeah, let me just remind our attendees again. We, we told you this in the beginning, but um, uh, three of our four panelists have published works. 
about uh, Iva Toguri, and they're all very much worth reading. You have our author's names uh, on your screen. Professor Shibasawa's uh, article came out 10 years ago, I want to say in the Journal of Gender and History. Anyway, and, um, and Professor Wallenberg and, and Mike Weedall have, have uh, published books. And I've gotten part of the way through Chuck's book, and I've read Professor Shibasawa's article, and I need to get a copy of, of Mike's book, but they're all worth reading. Um, chat box who actually seems to be involved that's oh i see that yeah okay so if you're if you're looking at your chat box there's information about these publications over there also that's great no meaning that somebody who is the the last one in the chat sorry somebody um who was involved um who was a liaison from for toguri oh look know. at this we mm -hmm. have someone in the audience who says i am a sansei living in chicago who was the JACL liaison to Iva during the movement to secure a pardon for her. Are you aware of the role that Dr. Myron Karopas, the special advisor for ethnic affairs to President Ford, played in securing the pardon? And just looking at the clock, why don't we let that be our, our last question? Wayne, you're our, our pardon point guy. Do you know the answer to that? No, but you know, you, the Attorney General makes a recommendation to the President on the, based on the recommendation of the Lawrence Schreller, the pardon attorney, it goes through a bunch of bureaucratic procedures. It's probably pretty much pro forma. But uh, I know nothing about this particular individual. Okay. That's the answer. Okay. Does any of our other panelists want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I'd like to uh, offer that another critical person in her pardon was Senator Daniel Inouye of um, uh, California. He was uh, very close to, uh, to, um, to uh, President uh, Ford. And you know, uh, if you read the book, uh, part of a true story is, again, Iva's father was critical on getting Daniel Inouye's father into the United States in time for Daniel Inouye to be born in this country. What a small I, world, that's, that's a small world angle. Yeah. And well, Inouye was a, was a center from Hawaii um, at that time, but anyway. Well, I just wanna thank all my panelists. If we were seated in an auditorium, Remember when we used to all be seated in an auditorium? <laughs> uh, if we were seated in an auditorium, I would ask you all to give them a big round of applause. I'll still ask you to do that. And uh, we'll imagine uh, the sound of it. Um, really outstanding presentations from all of you. I feel so lucky to have been able to moderate this um, program. I wanna thank both of the historical societies as well as their partners whose identities appear in the material and Neha Gupta and, and Scarlett Espinoza for keeping us all on track. Um, really, thank you so much. And that concludes this evening's program. Thank you.